Hello and welcome to the Bloodstream Podcast, a show serving the bleeding disorders community brought to you by Believe Limited and Bloodstream Media and made possible by our presenting sponsor, Takeda. I am your patient advocate and host, Patrick James Lynch. Hey, and I am your other host, also healthcare advocate, <laughs> also a nonprofit nerd. I'm Amy Board, reminding you to please speak with a healthcare professional before making any treatment decisions. On today's episode, the penultimate episode of 2021, and Amy, as we know from television, the penultimate episode of a season is really where it all comes together. That's where the big stuff goes down. It feels like a big word. I don't know. I would say second to last, but that's a big word. But that's four words, second to last. That's three words. Oh, boy. Oh, I'd say cut it, but we can't. All right. Well, here's who is coming on today. Amy and I... Well, we're fortunate to spend a little bit of time with the CEO and president of each of our two national organizations serving the bleeding disorders community here in the U.S. From the Hemophilia Federation of America, Sharon Myers joins us. And then later in the show, Len Valentino from the National Hemophilia Foundation joins us as well. Each will provide some thoughts on the year behind us, as well as a look ahead to the year that we have coming. Uh, we got Amy to do the Len conversation together. He was on the road and we didn't have a lot of time with him, but we were able to do that one together. Sharon, you spoke to solo, so I'm really, I'm as curious as the listener as to what's gonna come out of that interview. Yeah, well, Sharon and I are both from Colorado, so we spent just a little time talking about Colorado. I'm shocked. How much time did you spend on Taylor Swift? We didn't even talk about Taylor Swift, which is very shocking for Sharon and I. J JK, Sharon and I have not talked about Tay Swift. Uh, you know, I'll also let you know that somebody who will remain nameless recently texted me. Um, they were like, real talk. I was just listening to Bloodstream. Do you know who Harry Styles is? <laughs> to which I said, you said real talk. So I'll say, honestly, no. <laughs> Harry Styles fits into a bucket of people who are celebrities that I only know as being celebrities, which is definitely a sign of aging. But they just were very, they were like, thank God you have Amy in your life. And I said, I, I agree with you. So I wanted to give you that feedback. You're making people feel better about me, I think. Real talk. I actually got a text probably from the same person who shall remain nameless who says, does Patrick not know who Harry Styles is? By the way, still don't. Didn't take any time after that text or wasn't thinking I'd mention it now. So just as we're recording this, I still don't know who that is. Well, th this is actually great follow up for me because I can make some bullets and actions from this podcast. Like maybe I can send you a few photos, uh, links to some songs because I That's feel so... like you should know who Harry Styles is. Like why? <laughs> is it important? I I think so. Okay. Okay. Uh, you know what? We're not going to go into it because... Because um, this is a bleeding disorders podcast? Because it's a bleeding disorders podcast. <laughs> Listeners, if you have some reasons of why Patrick should know who Harry Styles is... You know what? Yes. You know, give us some. Give us a shout out on social. like Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, places you can find me. If you think I need to know something about Harry Styles... Send me what you think I need to know. That is a that's real. I'm I'm curious to see what I'm a little scared now that this is settling in and I'm processing what might happen. But go ahead, send me what you think I need to know about Harry Styles that my 2022 I guess can be even better. I don't know. I don't know. I do want to mention Amy as you uh, as you know as our listeners know the Bloodstream podcast is made possible in fact by our presenting sponsor Takeda. That's right. Takeda. And Takeda's got this website, bleedingdisorders.com. You can see how it's relevant. And that's where you can go to find information on Takeda's resources for and commitment to the bleeding disorders community. For wherever on your journey you may be, visit bleedingdisorders.com for more. And for their founding and ongoing commitment to the Bloodstream podcast, I would just like to say thank you, Takeda. Uh, Amy Board. Uh, we do have a lot to get to, but before we jump into I think we'll start with the interview with Sharon and then move into the conversation with Len. How are you doing today? What's going on in your world? I'm doing well. It's the, it's the end of the year, so it's kind of the, the tie-up of things. Right. But it, it feels good. I'm buying Christmas presents and, you know, doing the thing. How's that going? <laughs> it's good. That did, I don't believe you. I crushed some and I haven't crushed others. I've I've struck out on a few, you know, as as you do. Yeah, it's early. The thing I'm nervous about, I don't think I'm as far as long as you are, um, 
is what I've heard about just like shipping times and all the stuff that's impacting just like getting goods. Uh, I think for last minute people like me, uh, we got to be a little less, less last minutey, which time's running out for that to be the case. That's true. You're going to have a different Christmas this year because of Vivian, oh, yeah. I think. Yes, Because it's going to be so. all about the baby. And I mean, I know she's a bit like next year will probably be legit because she'll be psyched and be able to open presents and things. But it is going to be a different feel, I bet, for you. You know, if you follow my Instagram page, you may have seen a uh, like a, a pseudo Christmas card that we put out. I'll give you a little story behind the story. Um, my mother, also known as Bloodstream contributor from from times gone by, Mama Sue, she made it very clear months ago. So Patrick, last minute, Mom, not so last minute, months ago, she sent outfits to the house for all three of us and uh, made sure we tried them on. And then when she got here for Thanksgiving, she's like, yeah, and maybe you guys could put on the outfits and we could take some pictures. They could be used for your Christmas card. You could write something like, and I was like, oh, down to the caption, mom. You've got it figured out down. You have copyright notes on top of wardrobe and staging, photography, setting the date and time and deciding we're doing a card in the first place. Really so good that you're here. So That is mom behavior. Next year, Vivian may have more of an opinion of what ah! Christmas is like with Vivian in the picture, but other family members certainly have already started. So I'm definitely feeling the difference in Christmas with the baby, but I'm very much looking forward to it. Yeah, we'll be in Ohio. Uh, so by the time listeners listen to the, the next episode of the Bloodstream Podcast, I will be in the uh, the great state of Ohio with that part of the fam. And where where will you be traveling? to for this holiday season, Amy? We're doing everything. We decided to not choose. Everything. We're just doing 100% of the locations. So the whole country? The entire country that is meaningful to Rob and I. No, so we're wow. going, Rob's from Lynchburg, Virginia. So we're going back to Lynchburg, which is the greatest thing in the world. I love Lynchburg, Virginia. And then from there, we'll go to Colorado. So my brother and sister-in-law work in um, healthcare. They're both, uh, my brother's a nurse and my uh, sister is a respiratory therapist. And so they work Christmas, you know, so it worked out. So we're doing Christmas on the 29th. Nice. Good. So it'll be good. Good, good. All right. Well, I'm happy to hear that. I'm glad you guys are choosing to do everything and see everybody. Uh, we should move into the conversations now with uh, Sharon and then Len. I do want to mention one thing as a heme guy. I've talked to a few fellow patients in the last few weeks. And, you know, we're coming up on the end of the year, right? So like everything else, there's housekeeping and there's health housekeeping stuff to consider. I know for some, uh, getting their factor, getting prior authorizations for factor has changed and there are different needs at treatment centers. So this is something I've heard of now from a few people. So the, the, the thing I wanted to mention here on the podcast is just make sure as you are getting gifts for people or planning travel or trying to figure out if you can travel or how to have that relative over who's not vaccinated and how, like as you're trying to do all of these other things that are important, don't forget the blocking and tackling of what it means to live with a bleeding disorder and just make sure any of those procedural pieces that can be easy to overlook, pieces of mail that can be easy to sit in a pile, I speak from experience, just make sure you're getting to all of that stuff too. And now with that being said, Amy, I'll give the microphone back to you to set us up for this first interview. Hey, that is a good uh, reminder. Good reminder. And I'll like double down on that reminder. It's December. Everybody's done it, but make sure that you got your health care, your health insurance set for uh, January 1. Uh, I bet everybody does by now, but just make sure um, that that's all set. And heck, we're going into 2022. It's crazy. So let's get to it. Let's get to um, our first interview with Sharon Myers. And hey, this next segment is brought to you by Genentech. Genentech is a leader in the hemophilia community that strives to provide resources and support for people with hemophilia A. Genentech has services that can help you learn more about insurance coverage and understand treatment costs. They can also put you in contact with the hemophilia clinical education manager. To learn more about Genentech and how they can provide support, visit www.hemasupport.com. Again, that is www.hemasupport.com. And let's get to it. Let's get to my conversation with Sharon. Patrick's going to find out about all this, too. I can't wait. We're here with Sharon Myers, the CEO of HFA and one of my favorite people, also a Coloradan. So we have to like get that out in the beginning. She's from Colorado. I am from Colorado. It's lovely to see you again, Sharon. Hi, how are you? Great to see you. Yeah, the weather is a little chilly this week in Colorado. So 
it's nice though. It's been like unseasonably warm. So Right. There hasn't been a snow in Colorado, which is like yeah. unheard of. So that's like big news. Yeah. No snow in Colorado yet. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, they have snow in the mountains, but here on the front range, they it's it's just been very, very warm. And usually we have snow like like we have snow in September, you know? Yeah. And so we're already we're in December, right? Yeah. And we haven't even had snow. <laughs> crazy. It's crazy. <laughs> Well, thinking about 2021, this crazy year um, in your work with HFA, tell me a little bit about some highlights. What were some highlights from your year? Yeah, I mean, it was, it's been a really good year. And I mean, even we didn't expect to be virtual year two, but we were able to just come in there and do, you know, our Dateline Live and Symposium and a lot of uh, webinars. And so that's really I would say that's a, a highlight from 2021. We didn't expect to still be virtual, but we we managed to uh, do everything that we wanted to do virtually. And then one of the things I'm really proud of this year is we truly focused on mental health at HFA. And it's been an area that we've been reticent to focus on in the past because we're not a mental health organization. But we realized if we can provide resources and, you know, conversations and and webinars and things like that to increase the dialogue about mental health and and wellness, that's an area that we can move the needle. And so we really focused on mental health, started out the year with a lot of webinars and all kinds of things, including at the organization. We focused on that with our staff and organizationally, you know, the things that we can do and and that's really, truly been a highlight because we, we realize that that is needed in this community and we need to talk about mental health mm. in this community. And so that's been, it's been wonderful. We kind of started the year going, I don't know how this is going to work, but it's now that we're at the end, we realize that this was truly, truly needed. What did you learn about HFA's mission and vision and a position in the community over the past 12 months? That's a great question. So we realized that we really are on target. I mean, we feel good about um, what we're doing at HFA and that we truly have value and that we provide value to the community and that we're continually seen as a resource. I mean, we, we sometimes forget when we're like, we'll have a community member will come to us and go, I can't get the lights on, you know, so we'll all scramble to make sure that gets taken care of. But we forget that we really do have a lot of resources and we're a you know, a repository of information if people need it. And we forget all that because we want to do what we can to help the community. And that, you know, I really feel good with our mission that that people still want us and, and need us and, and that we can still, you know, assist, educate and advocate in this community. And we did a survey. It was last year, though. It was called a story branding survey. And it mm-hmm. takes this really complicated, like Joseph Campbell's archetypes and, and different things. It all came out of like Georgetown University. And, and even though it doesn't seem very like academic or scientific, it was really cool when we went through it. And it puts you in categories of archetypes. And so when we did it, we actually had the community fill it out and staff and the whole thing. And we found out that HFA is a sage. So people really do look look to us for information and that we're a caregiver, that we really do care about this community and, and that we're here to help. And so it was really, it was a neat exercise to do the story branding. We also found out that we were fun. So that was another, <laughs> <laughs> that was another part. That's great. <laughs> so we were like jester or something like that. I, think I love that. that. <laughs> So it was really good. Yeah. It, That's lovely. It was so fun. It was so fun doing that. And it was neat seeing our archetypes because we thought we might be caregiver, um, but we yeah. had no idea that even though we see ourselves as sage, you know, others see us that, is, others that way as well. So, What did you learn about your role in particular over these last 12 months? Ooh. So my <laughs> year two. <laughs> it's a loaded year. question. <laughs> So I learned to be very flexible, like whatever plans I had, might as well just throw this out the window. Why even bother having plans? And so, um, so no, I did really, I learned how to be really flexible with the plans. And, and at the end of the day, it's not what I want or what I need. It really is what this community needs. And so it's like for symposium, a perfect example, we had our recent symposium and it was from five to about eight o'clock at night on the East Coast. And that wasn't convenient for the staff because we all 
we're all like, okay, make sure you only work like eight hours that day. Well, everybody worked their normal schedule during the day and then worked like three hours right. at night. You just can't seem to make it work. So that wasn't really convenient for us, but it was what the community needed. And it's what mm. they they responded to in other webinars, like the later time of the day actually worked out better. And so so that's what we really, what I learned and what uh, the organization learned is it's not always about us, that we need yeah. to make sure it's convenient for the community and truly listening to understand. And I know that's that's really hard sometimes, but you know, we have to we have to listen to each other to understand, not just to hear what people are saying. Anything that, that was surprisingly challenging, surprisingly difficult <laughs> in our second COVID year yeah, as you branded yeah. it? I hate to admit it, and leaders probably hate to admit this, but making decisions has been really hard this year because mm. oh and we gosh, talked yeah. about that as a staff, that it's Probably we're feeling some decision fatigue because decisions are really hard when you don't have all of the information and the decisions that you're making have so many like nuances and you have nothing to benchmark it off of. Yes. You know, it's just really, it's really challenging to make decisions and you're just, you're constantly pivoting. I know everybody hates that word because we've all pivoted so much. We're like, that one just needs to not even be said anymore. So we moved our office to the, the funny part at the beginning of this year, we actually, um, the building came to us and said, oh, we want to use your space for office space. So, so we ended up moving upstairs next floor up. So we moved offices. So that was a little bit challenging oh, we had to move in the middle of the year. We've had a little bit, a little bit higher than normal turnover as well. We also were feeling the effects of the, what is it? The great resignation or something. Yes. We're talking about. So turnover has been a little bit higher. And so if you're looking for a job, we still have some positions open, not you, but I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want Packer calling me and going, oh, what man, did you, just you would. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's good to know if you're interested I, on the website, HFA's website. Yeah. So it's been, it's been challenging just like just making decisions. And it's funny, I've yeah. talked to people, you know, who've been CEOs for many, many years and they're like, Sharon, this is like new day for all of us. So, yes. You know, Looking forward to 2022, what are you most anticipating or what are you focusing on? So we're really focused on getting back to somewhat normal. You know, I think we're all going to have a slightly bit normal or change in normal. We're planning on a lot of the same, you know, great things that we're doing with education and, you know, policy and advocacy, um, really focusing on our health disparities program and our fly in and we're hoping to have like a blood brotherhood camp out and numerous things like that. And then of course we're going to reopen our office. I mean, we're all still pretty much working from home, even though we do go into the office somewhat, that's going to be open symposium. We're still hoping that that's going to be in person um, in April, April 20th through the 23rd. So we're all crossing our fingers. Oh, I don't know about you, but I could definitely use a margarita and a taco on the river walk. So yes, <laughs> yes, we talk about it all the time. We're all just we just can't wait to be in a Marriott hallway with everybody right on the river walk. It's going to be oh. really beautiful, but we're going to do it as safely as possible. And we're following CDC guidelines. And so, you know, we're just going to do our best and try to figure out as much as we can and do it safely. Um, Looking forward to some Run Disney events like the Run Disney Marathon and the Princess and all those. Those are going to be really, you know, exciting. I don't know. It's just that whole getting back together. Like this, this community really needs to see each other and be back together. And as a matter of fact, our symposium, we often get told that our symposium is like a family reunion. And so we've decided to embrace that. And we are calling it a Texas size family reunion. So I think that's going to be fun since it's. Oh my gosh, I love that! I have not heard that yeah. yet, so I apologize if I missed it on like social media or something. But I just will give my, you know, I don't know if you care about my opinion, but I love it. I do. I do. Thank you so much. Oh, I love that, and I'm sure you know our listeners uh, can't wait. So thank you for sharing that. Is there anything that community advocates or leaders who are listening should be particularly mindful of in 2022 as we kind of look forward? So we're going to be doing some strategic planning um, in mm -hmm. 2022. It's been a few years, I think it's been since we've done strategic planning. So we're actually going to do that. So there's some people are going to be asked um, to be, you know, their opinions and a little bit of a focus groups and things like that. So you may be getting that as well. Um, some of the community leaders may have heard that we're restructuring 
the board down from a 53 member board down to about a 15 member board. And I know you are an ED, so can you even imagine having a 53 member board? That is a lot oh of people gosh. on a board. So that is a lot. Wait, and uh, but some of those members are the member organizations, right? They are. Yeah, they okay. are. Since we have 50 member organizations, each one had someone on the board. And so we're just going to kind of restructure that down to about a 15 member board. Um, so it's going to be just downsize some. And they'll still have the same, you know, they'll have representation and things. But, so yeah, just restructuring it, that's going to be, we're already working on the process. And so it's, okay. it's going through. So I think it's going to be really good. It's just a lot that's of people on the board and can sometimes <laughs> make it challenging. And it's hard, it's hard for people to speak up it's- anyway. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, that, seems, that seems like a good move. And um, Bravo, I can't wait to hear the update on that. I, I bet that's wonderful. And yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> congratulations. Any worries or fears that you have uh, thinking about the bleeding disorders community in 2022? Any concerns going into next year? Yeah, I mean, not really a worry or a fear, but, um, you know, we have had success in the States and at the federal level with the copay accumulators. And so there's just still a lot more work that needs to be done on that. There's a bill uh, on the floor right now that we're working towards. And so that just needs to continue to be worked on. And then, of course, still addressing the um, out-of-pocket costs and, you know, access to care and coverage. Those are always important. And really like what we talked about in the beginning, mental health is another one that we really need to not really a worry or a fear, but it's just we, we need to keep focusing on that and just we need to educate each other in the community and take that stigma away from mental health and so that way we can help each other and be there for each other. I think the only real worry or fear maybe out of that is just that getting back face to face. It's going to be challenging. And, and, and the reason is, is, I mean, coming back together, like we want to do it in a safe way and you know, we want to make sure that everybody is comfortable with everything. So like, like we were talking about for symposium, we're thinking we may either have like different colored lanyards or even a different colored name badge that's like green. Yes. Come up and hug me all you want or yellow. I don't know. I'm a little bit cautious <laughs> or red. Maybe not hug me today. Or <laughs> so we need to, we have to figure that out. Like, how do we do the meals? Like, what are, how are we going to do the exhibit right. halls? So there's, there's a lot of uh, questions and then coming back together. I think at, at the local level, they've done a lot more bringing groups back together, but a lot of things have been outside. And, and so this is going to be I think we'll have the first bigger conference in the bleeding disorders community in April. And so I, we're going to, we're going to figure that one out. So just be patient oh, with us as we, as we figure it out. We want to make sure that everybody comes back together, but we come back together safely. Entering into a new normal. Yeah. It's been wonderful uh, speaking with you as always, Sharon, just to kind of close this out. What's your, what's your message? What's your number one top message to the community as we start the new year? Yeah. The, the just HFA is just coming back and, this new year or heading into the new year, just stronger than ever. Things are going extremely well, but it, but we want to connect with you and, and we want to grow with you and we want to enjoy this journey together and bring each other a little bit of joy together. And so we just enjoy this time and it's been challenging and we've missed everyone so much, And but we're looking forward to getting back together and, and being stronger than ever. Sharon, thank you. It's always a pleasure. So good to see you. Thank you Absolutely. So much. Thank you. Bravo. And here's hoping that we can all be family reunion in April. April oh my yes. gosh. Crossing fingers. President and CEO from HFA, Sharon Myers. Wow. What she had some stuff to say, huh, Amy? She sure did. You want to give a rundown of some of your favorite things that she said? I would love to. There was the point she made about um uh, oh, going under a tunnel. No, I haven't heard it yet. I still haven't heard it. I will listen to it when the episode <laughs> comes out. This we recorded just after the other piece. I'm excited by your enthusiasm for it. I did hear the conversation we had with Len Valentino while he was traveling between this, that, and the other thing and was able to give us a few minutes on the road. So let's go to that part of the conversation next. Our discussion with NHF CEO and President Len Valentino. All right, Amy and I are now joined by the NHF CEO and President, Dr. Len Valentino. Len, thanks for being with us today. Welcome back to Bloodstream. 
Thanks, Patrick. Thanks for inviting me. Of course, of course. So with the goal being uh, to provide a little bit of 2021 retrospective and a little bit of 2022 vision, let's start with the year behind us. What are a couple of your top highlights from 2021? You know, it's, it's been a long year for many reasons, but I think it's also been a pretty productive year. I think if we go back to Washington Day that was held virtually because of the coronavirus pandemic, I think we had a very successful virtual Washington Day. That was really a sentinel event for us, uh, being able to interact in, in that virtual environment and still being able to, to have types of conversations that are so important to ensure that our public officials understand the issues for people with disorders that our community is facing. And then, you know, obviously, you know, you can fast forward to uh, the research state of the science, and, and that was the, a tremendous uh, uh, engagement opportunity for the community to talk about research priorities and what's important to people with uh, bleeding disorders. I think we've also had some tremendous opportunities to interact around the field nursing facility, a bill that was passed. I think that was a tremendous accomplishment for us as a community and really signals our leadership, disease community, but also importantly is a model for other rare diseases to follow for us to be able to get something like that accomplished. I think the work that our payer team has done with uh, accumulator adjuster and other programs that are you know, essentially designed to limit access for people who need the care the most. So I, I think our teams have really done a lot over the last year. It's been tremendously challenging, but you know, in retrospect, a really productive and, and successful year for NHL and more importantly mm-hmm. for the community. Len, I love this next question because it has like a dose of third grade to it, but also adulting. What did you learn? What did you learn about yourself in this role in the last 12 months? And what did you learn about the community? The tremendous resilience and fortitude that people in this community have, you know, personally, there's no challenge that's too big. Really have that commitment to be able to ensure that people are able to thrive. And, you know, again, it just goes back to resilience and stamina throughout our community. Speaking of challenges, was anything surprisingly challenging or difficult in this year, especially with COVID, I guess? I think the challenge is helping people navigate the unknown, the uncertainty. Variants, you know, continue to pop up and challenges are are continuing. And there are continued challenges that our community faces. And you never know exactly where those challenges are going to come from. And it's important to remain vigilant and remain alert so you're not blindsided. Looking ahead now into 2022, what are you most anticipating or most focused on as the new year kicks off? Yeah, so I, I think that there, there's a couple of things. One is the implementation of the skilled nursing facility bill, I think is going to be important. We're learning that there's challenges in other venues like rehabilitation centers where the similar types of, of challenges to access uh, may be an issue. The other area that I'm really excited about 2022 is the implementation of your data science research team working with community members to really bring that to life and ensure that we have a, a cohesive plan moving forward to bring innovation, to bring science to people with bleeding disorders so that they can thrive. That's another area that I'm really looking forward to. And then from you know, my own personal goal for 2022 in my position is going to be really working with the community members on access to care, ensuring that our public policy team and our peer relations team have everything that they need to ensure that we can provide the best opportunities for access to care, access to innovative treatment, access to innovative diagnostics and therapeutics, and most importantly, access to care. People need to be able to see their healthcare professionals on a regular basis without interruption. It may be things like telehealth and telemedicine, but also transportation and, and you know, the, the interpretive services that are so desperately needed in some areas of our community. So access to care is really going to be an important priority for me in 2022. You bring up a really important point, which is policy can be passed, a new program or initiative can launch, a new research agenda can be set, but 
it's really not until the full implementation of these things takes place that the rubber meets the road. The policy doesn't do too much if it doesn't go beyond being passed and is never implemented. And you're bringing that up, which I appreciate. So with these things in mind, is there anything in particular that community advocates and leaders who are listening should be mindful of as the new year kicks off? Is there a particular area of focus or just something that you hope leaders and advocates around the country are particularly mindful of? Really, it's a call to action. We need everybody working together as one unifying voice. We're hoping that we can get more community voices in. And then throughout the year, is having to work hand in hand, lending their expertise, their experience and their knowledge to make sure that that all can come to fruition and really galvanizing the community in such a way that we're able to achieve far more. And I, I, I really hope that 2022 can be that year where the community comes together and brings all of our talents, all of our expertise and all of our experience to bear so that really can help people with inheritable blood disorders to thrive. Len, to close, what can the community expect from NHF in 2022? Well, I think from NHF, we will continue to work in terms of advocacy and education, as well as bringing innovation to the forefront, including mental health, digital health, and to share their experiences and their voices with us. Well, if I could summarize in two letter I words, implementation and input. Those are two of my big takeaways from this discussion, implementation and community input. Len, I know you're on the road and we had some tech challenges, so thanks for sticking with us and giving us a few minutes to provide some of this visionary point of view for the community going into next year. Appreciate your role, appreciate your service, and always appreciate your time. Thanks for coming on Bloodstream. A big bloodstream thank you to both Dr. Len Valentino and Sharon Myers, the CEOs and presidents of NHF and HFA, respectively. Appreciate your time uh, and appreciate your perspective. It's, these are two of our community's most vital leaders, um, and they are coming out of two very challenging years like the rest of us. So it's it, good to hear where their minds are going into this next year. And, you know, I'm hopeful that, Amy, a year from now, we are having a much different kind of conversation about the year behind us and the year in front. But uh, I'm really glad we were able to have them on the podcast this week as 2021 starts to wind to a close. And with that being said, we've got one episode left for this year. Amy, can you give listeners a little preview of our final episode, the ultimate or final episode of Bloodstream in 2021? Yeah, just like we had um, Sharon and Dr. Valentino on today to do kind of like the state of the organizations um, and what they thought of this year and going into next, we are going to do that. You and me, we're going to kind of uh, share a little bit about what this year has been like, some highlights, maybe some lowlights, and what um, we can look forward to in 2022 in the bleeding disorders community. I think from a from a patient and from an advocate perspective, what we are looking forward to, um, maybe some challenges and hesitations about going into 2022. But yeah, join us uh, next week uh, as Patrick and I can have a conversation about what this year yeah. has been like. It's been a weirdo year. It has. Yeah. I think in some ways, Amy, it'll feel a little similar to what we did during the BDC, you know, where we had a little more time and space to just kind of connect on things. And I think that'll be a nice way for us to round out the year. So that's coming up. That'll be the final episode of the calendar year coming out two weeks from today. Um, but before we wrap, I do want to acknowledge that um, on December 4th, we lost a community member, member by the name of Cyrus Pavri. Cyrus uh, was the father to two Teen Impact awardees and an Adam Lynch scholarship recipient and Farah Pavri, her brother Porus, also a Teen Impact awardee, also a participant in Hemophilia the Musical and our Breaking Through program. That's a family that we here at Bloodstream and Believe Limited have known intimately and for quite some time. Cyrus's death was unexpected and is devastating and disorienting for those who knew him and for a family that has already experienced quite a lot of loss in the recent past, just quite a blow. I'm also aware that Cyrus's passing is not the only passing that's affected this community. And sometimes here on Bloodstream, we are uh, in a position to highlight certain people who have passed. We are in a position to honor them or pay tribute because we had a relationship to that person or someone who has has come forward with something or, or whatever the case may be. And this is one of those 
moments. Cyrus was someone of dear importance to me personally, to my wife, to our family, and to this company. And so we want to take a moment to just acknowledge his passing and what a moment that is. And at the same time, I want to acknowledge, even in the very recent past, I'm aware of Blood Brothers and other people in the community who have recently passed. So again, as this year closes, uh, something else that we will make sure to take a moment, or I should say we should all make sure to take a moment to do, is to reflect on, on those that we have lost and how we carry their their impact and their legacies forward into next year and beyond. This is something I think about quite a bit with regard to my brother and other people I love. How do I continue to keep them going with me as I move forward? So just a moment to say, send our love to the Poverty family. Wish them peace and solace wherever they may be able to find it during this grieving process. If you're interested to know more or if, if you're learning of this and you knew Cyrus, if you know the Poverty family, I would recommend reaching out to the New York City Hemophilia Chapter. That's a good home base you can go for more information. They've put out some communications about services and ways that you can engage if you'd like. And if you'd like more information, that's a place you can go to the New York City Hemophilia Chapter. Amy, any final word that you would like to offer before we close? No, that's not at all. Thank you, friend. All right. Well, with that, that is all for this episode. If you have a bleeding disorder or health topic you'd like to hear us discuss more, if there's a guest or an expert you're dying to hear from, or if you want to inquire about Bloodstream's storytelling and casting opportunities, you can email us mailbag at bloodstreammedia.com. You can also connect with Bloodstream Media on social media. You'll find Bloodstream Media on Facebook, on Instagram, and on Twitter. You can also follow Amy Board or me, Patrick James Lynch, on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or LinkedIn. Shout out, Amy Board. Shout out. LinkedIn has made the list official. I am your host, Patrick James Lynch. And I am your other host, Amy Board. And until next time, take self-care of yourself. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.